As we gather for worship this morning, please take your hymnal, the Red Trinity hymnal, turn to hymn 179. Hallelujah, thine the glory. 179. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service at Covenanters. It's a joy to gather with you here on the Lord's Day uh, in this particular church as, uh, as God's church, Christ's people meet all around the world and are worshiping Him. Uh, a very special welcome to visitors, especially our, uh, our young adults who are here for our young adult retreat uh, this weekend. I don't want to exclude anybody. Also, you not-so-young adults, you're also very welcome to be here. Um, but it's great to have you, and it's been a wonderful weekend already. I trust the Lord will particularly bless uh, worship. This is the peak of our week. This is the high point of our life here on earth, that is to meet with our God in public worship. This is a taste of heaven, and uh, it is a joy to be together as God's people, and uh, as we one day will be gathered together in heaven. Today, uh, in addition to the preaching of the Word this morning, we also have the privilege of uh, participation in the Lord's Supper and uh, so that uh, will follow the Word. Um, and uh, if you're visiting with us in the bulletin, uh, it is an insert in the bulletin, you can affirm the five questions uh, that are there uh, in your heart. If you can affirm those in good conscience before God, you're welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. I know some of you, different backgrounds, might have to meet with elders of a church you're visiting. Or that. That's not how we fence the table here. And so, um, I leave it with you and uh, those questions, and I'll also speak to the fencing of the table uh, when we come to the time of the Lord's Supper. And then following our morning worship service uh, and a time of uh, refreshments, we'll have a fellowship meal as well. And so uh, if you're visiting, uh, certainly welcome to participate in that with us, to enjoy that with us, and we'll look forward to having that time to get to know you better. And then this afternoon at 4.30, we gather again to worship our God and to close our Lord's Day uh, with worship, and so we'll gather at 4.30 for our afternoon service. Let's take a few moments 
uh, now to prepare our hearts for this service uh, with silent prayer, and then the Lord will call us to worship. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, please stand and hear your God call you to worship. God speaks to us from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious and His righteousness endures forever. Let's pray. O Lord our God, You have called us out of the world and gathered us together in this place to come to worship You. O Lord our God, we pray now that You would recall to mind Your great works that You have done in history and that You have done in our own lives. Fill us with high thoughts of You upon which to meditate, to focus our minds and Uh, Lord, fill our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would hear from Your Word, and what we hear that we would believe with our hearts, and what we believe that we would declare with our mouths. For You are worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Oh God, we come from various places. We come from various parts of this country. We come with different backgrounds. Uh, different interests, different ethnicities, all sorts of differences. And Lord, even we're in a, we live in a world that divides into microgroups, but we come together today as one people with our identity in Jesus Christ and our Father as God above and with our desire to serve You, Lord, by the same Spirit. We pray that You would enable us then, triune God, as Your people, to worship well. Lord, are there any hearts that are here that are unchanged from sin and thus unable to worship You in truth? Change them. Remove whatever it is that separates them from You. And we pray that in any of us, whatever sin there is, whatever distractions there are, whatever, whatever choices we've made that are causing separation, that are, that are interfering with our relationship with You, O oh God, so this morning remove them and enable us to worship You better and better. Uh, Lord, we pray, do mighty work still in us, changing us, and changing, Lord, and growing and maturing us as Your people. We pray all of this then, with high expectations and hopes for this time with You in this service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please take your hymnal and we'll sing now hymn 40, God is our refuge and our strength.
seated. It is good at the time that we gather into the presence of Holy God to hear His law, to understand how He wants us to live before Him, and to have the privilege of seeking both His forgiveness and His grace so we might live well with Him. And so we'll hear God's law and the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20 this morning. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Let's confess our sin before God as we come before Him in prayer and seek Christ. O Lord our God, for us to live well, Your Word must shine upon our path, both to reveal our sin and to show us the way to live. It directs us to You. And we thank You, O God, that Your law does just that, that as we come to it, it is a sign that reveals to us, Lord, where we have gone astray and need repentance and forgiveness and correction. And it is also, Lord, the sign that points us in the way and commands us to walk in it. We thank you, God, and we pray that your uh, your law would be that light this morning in our hearts, specifically to show us our sin and to then be used of you to make us holy as a covenant people. We pray, Lord, that uh, that you would lighten our path, that you would shine brighter and brighter, that we would understand these things more and more. We pray that you would enable us to walk in this good way until Jesus Christ returns. Lord our God, we confess our sins to you now. We acknowledge as we hear your law where we have not followed you. Lord, we pray that you would forgive our sins and lead us well. We no longer want to follow in the ways that oppose your law, but we want to be faithful even as Christ was faithful, that we might be holy even as you are holy. Lord, give us then to grow with a growth that is from you, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to hold to, that we would hold to our way following Him, that you would cleanse our hands and grow us stronger and stronger. O Lord, our God, rescue us from every evil deed and bring us safely into your heavenly kingdom. Lord, that you would keep us from stumbling and that you would present us blameless, Lord Jesus, at the coming of your glory in that great day. O Lord, Uh, Father in heaven, even as your Son prayed and is praying for us, until we are taken out of the world, Lord, may we be kept from the evil one and sanctified by your truth, that is, by your word. Lord, we pray uh, that you would do that work even today as you speak to us from your word. We pray that you would strengthen us to fight the good fight of faith and to fight the good fight against evil and sin and temptation and all that, that beckons to us, but that which is wrong. O oh Lord, as we live for you now in this world, we do pray also that you would lift our eyes to see the world to come, that we, each one of us, would know that our citizenship is in heaven, and that from there we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will one day perfect us and transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, 
removing all sin, removing all desire, and removing all temptation. What a day that will be, O Lord our God. But even now already you've begun that work in us. Already now, Lord, you have broken the bondage of sin and you are purifying us more and more and we bless you for it. We pray, keep that work ongoing in our lives until we are received by you in glory. And we pray with confidence and with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our words of assurance as we hear the call to holiness, as we confess our sin, as we seek the grace of God, well, we have assurance that God will indeed give us that grace as His people to live for Him. And this morning, we hear words from 1 Corinthians 10, which as you ponder them and think about them, should give you great comfort and encouragement in how God protects you and provides for you and enables you to overcome temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Well, now we have the opportunity to give thanks to our God. He has freely given us salvation. We have earned nothing. We have bought nothing. He has given us His own Son to save us. Now we have the privilege out of thanksgiving and joy to give back to Him And so we'll take up our tithes and offerings uh, this morning. Please take your hymnal and we'll turn to hymn 692 as we come to the reading and preaching of God's Word. We'll sing hymn 692, To You, O Lord, I Fly, and we'll stand to sing.
The Word of God this morning, uh, we'll first we'll be reading in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 for our New Testament reading, and then we'll move to Jeremiah 29. Second Thessalonians 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he has received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now may the the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now let's turn to Jeremiah 29. I'm going to read and preach from uh, the first nine verses there in Jeremiah 29. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets And your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Let's ask the Lord to bless His word as we consider it this morning. Lord, we pray that you would instruct us in your ways and enable us to take from your word to understand it that we might uh, also understand how to live by it and what even this text from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah has to say to us today. We pray that you would then minister to us by the same Spirit that gave us the Scriptures. So minister in our own souls, help us to understand, and give us a desire to live. And we pray work that your Word would not return empty. We pray you give me this grace to 
proclaim and preach. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen us to receive it in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather this morning, uh, many of you have been here much of the weekend and and many of you have not. And so it's helpful to perhaps lay a bit of that context for why I'm going to be preaching in Jeremiah 29 this morning. The the, the, uh, young adults retreat that we've been having this weekend has been under this theme of a very familiar phrase, a phrase we're familiar with, of being in the world but not of the world. What does it mean to be in the world but not of the world? And it may uh, surprise those of you who uh, haven't already been surprised by this earlier in the week to know that that phrase, as popular as it is, is not a direct quote of any particular Scripture passage. It's, you know, there's no chapter and verse to point to directly that has that the phrase in that way. But the concept certainly is found in Scripture all over. And particularly as we uh, looked at it uh, from when Jesus was in the upper room the night before his crucifixion, and the time he spent with his disciples, and we find him speaking to his disciples on this very theme, and particularly John 15, 19, where he says, if you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I had chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And then as Jesus then would be praying for his disciples, but not for them only, but for all who would believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so you and me this morning, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, Jesus was praying in John 17, and He prayed to the Father. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. He goes on to say uh, in verse 18, as you have sent me into the world, speaking to His Father, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And so he's saying, we're not of the world, but yet we've been sent into the world still as believers. We're not yet taken out of the world. And as we considered this theme a few days ago and, and over this weekend, the, the, the idea of world, the way John uses the word world in this particular context is, he's, is as a reference to that system of rebellion that uh, that, that exists in our fallen and unregenerate world, where there is a, that, that the world is, is not just the created order, or anything, it's, it's that rebellious part of creation that has its own plans, its own directions, its own desires, its own ways of living, and that are, uh, that where they continue to hate God and love what God hates. And so all who are yet, who are not only fallen into sin, but have remained unregenerate, who are not believers in Christ, continue to be part of that world system. Continue. So if you are not in Christ this morning, the call is to come out of the world and into Christ through faith. Because so long as you're outside of Christ, you're part of the world that the church has been called out of. That's where we also consider that. The believer, the the, the one whose faith in Jesus Christ has been called out. It's actually what church means in in the original language in Greek, is the called out one. We are those who have been told, as Paul told the Philippians, that your citizenship is in heaven. We have, we are no, we are now strangers in this world. And yet, God has not removed us. God has not just saved us and automatically we enter into heaven as soon as we have believed, as soon as we've been regenerated and and have put our faith in Jesus Christ. But rather, He has sent us into the world in order that now with a new master and with new desires... Uh, we would serve God faithfully, do His work, serve the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we would do that so long as God has determined it is necessary for us to remain in the world. Brothers and sisters, there are are no shortcuts to heaven. There's no petitioning that God would just take us now because we don't want to deal with the troubles and struggles and trials that come. Jesus is pretty upfront about that. John 15, the world will hate you, hated me, it will hate you. But rather, by the grace of God who is always with us, we are to, with patience, endure. And with patience and perseverance, press on living as in all the ways that God calls us to live in the world, doing His work until He calls us out of it. And indeed, there's good work to do. This is not just biding our time. This is not just pointless. This is not just uh, arbitrary. But there's good work that God gives us to do that will not just matter for today, but matter forever. So what we're going to do today is kind of a two-part 
mini-series, as it were. I'm going to focus us in, in Jeremiah 29, on what it means to live in the world now. What God calls us, how God calls us to live in the here and now in, as those who are in the world, though not of it. And then Pastor John, uh, this afternoon, uh, will, is planning to, to preach on the world to come, looking to the world to come, living now while looking to the world to come. And so for our time this morning, as, as we need to hold these things uh, together, of course, as Christians. We need to live these ways together. I could continue on in Jeremiah 29 and cover both, cate- both topics, as it were, but I want to just focus us really and spend our time here living in the present world. And we're going to do so from Jeremiah 29, from the, the first part of Jeremiah's letter to the exiles who are living in Babylon. And though it was written uh, a long time ago, and though it was, it was a written to a particular nation, and though there's many ways in which there's a disconnect between then and now, yet there are many ways that we're linked, and we can take the same instructions, and this letter is still very instructive for you and me as Christians living today in the New Covenant. So we're going to consider these nine verses under this theme, that your Christian calling in this world is to work faithfully for your God until He brings you out. Your Christian calling in this world is to work faithfully for your God until He brings you out. We're going to see how God has placed you in the world in verses 1 to 4. Then we're going to spend bulk of our time how God calls you to work for Him in the world, verses 5 to 7, and then the command to listen to the call of God in verses 8 and 9. So first, God has placed you in the world, verses 1 to 4. Now, Jeremiah the prophet had, uh, was writing to or, or had been preaching, prophesying, being the mouthpiece of God to the people of Judah, both uh, before the exile and through the exile uh, into the time where the people had been taken out of the promised land bit by bit and relocated into, uh, into, into Babylon and into captivity. And he had warned them of this captivity. He, like many of the prophets, had warned them that if they did not live faithful before God, if they would not repent of their sins and their covenant unfaithfulness, God would remove them from the promised land, that He would separate them and scatter them to the nations. And, uh, and, and that would be part of their punishment and to, and to call them also to repentance. This was part of that relationship they had with God. They had, were in a covenant with God, and there were blessings and promises, and God had always been faithful to them. And yet, there were also those covenant curses, threatenings, and warnings against them if they were to be unfaithful to God. And for hundreds of years, they had been uh, back and forth, but had been more and more unfaithful and God had been so gracious and patient, but now that time was coming for their captivity. And so what we have in the context here, there were three deportations of Jews into Babylon. There was 605 B.C., which was the first one, and uh, that you, uh, you read of in, uh, in Daniel chapter 1. That's where Daniel, that was the Daniel deportation, where uh, they went, uh, they were sent to Babylon. And then eight years later, uh, in, in 597 is the second deportation, and that's what we read about here in Jeremiah. This is the one that, uh, that, that, that after the, that deportation, Jeremiah sent this letter uh, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar took the king off the throne, put another king, put Zedekiah in place. And then 11 years later, Zedekiah rebelled in 586, and that was the final deportation and also the time when the temple was burned and, uh, and Jerusalem, large sections of it were, were destroyed, the walls broken down. And so that was uh, the final deportation of Jews. But here again, it's after that second deportation where uh, many had been taken out, the temple had been raided, hadn't been destroyed yet, but it was, had been raided and all the, the treasures were taken and placed in, in pagan temples. And, uh, and, and Jeremiah is writing now to these people that were living in Babylon in a very different place, a very different culture, and who are also hearing a constant message, if you read chapter 28, or hearing a constant message from false prophets who said, don't worry, two years from now, Babylon is going to be destroyed, or going to be so weak, and you're going to go free. Two years, that's it. That's your captivity. These are probably the same prophets who said, don't worry, the temple's in Jerusalem, God will never let anything happen to you, and just as long as we have the temple, you'll be fine. And now, well, that didn't turn out to be true, but now they're saying, Hey, a couple years, tops, that's it. But in verse 4, we find uh, the word of the Lord, really the only word that matters, the word of the Lord coming to His people. 
and we hear him speak to them of a very different uh, outcome. As he had told them, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. And in some sense, you, had, you need to get used to that. You need to believe that. You stop looking for the easy out and the quick escape. You will be there for 70 years. And we see what he says in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts. There's an emphasis on his sovereign power over all the world. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of the armies. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Still an emphasis there on the God of the covenant. The God who's faithful to his people. This is the God who's speaking to all who are carried away captive whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. You see, he's not saying, hey, that Nebuchadnezzar guy, I, I, I didn't see that coming. He, that was a really bad thing. But you'll be there for a few decades, and then maybe I'll find a way to get you free. No, God is saying, I've sent you there. You're there because of me, not because Nebuchadnezzar. He was an instrument in my hand. But I used him to bring my just uh, judgment upon you. God's saying, I've put you there. And if, the, if this is the God who has sent them into exile then sh- and they refuse to listen then, perhaps they might learn and say, you know, we should listen to him about when we're going to get out of exile. The only one they should have heeded now was the same God who put them there and stopped trying to look for a different message. They needed to hear from him. And actually, what a mercy it is that God still had a message for them. What a, 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 an indication that God hadn't utterly cast them off, thrown them out, and said, enough, you just go to Babylon, and, and, and we're going to part ways. I'm going my way, you go your way, and that's it. No more relationship. Covenant's done. No, God still had a message for them. The God of Israel still wanted to reach to His people, and He still wanted to speak to them and call them to faithfulness. And the first lesson, then, that we learn for our own lives today is this, that the Lord has placed you sovereignly and uh, faithfully, but He has placed you where you are. He has placed you in this time period. He's placed you where you live. He's placed you with whom you live. He's placed you in the particular challenges of life as well with the particular joys of life. God is the one who has sovereignly put you where you are. You and I are uh, in this life. He's kept us in this world. He sent us into the world. We're not of this world, so, but, we, uh, but we are still here. We're, we're, uh, in the language of Scripture, we are sojourners, those who uh, don't, don't really, aren't setting our roots here, but are just our dwellers here. We're pilgrims. We're homesick, uh, but, uh, and, and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to, to what comes next, but still we are here. God has placed us here for now. Now, there's a difference, of course, between us and the Jews in that they were placed in Babylon because of their sin and wickedness. We're not in this world because we're sinners. We are sinners, but we're not placed in this world. You're not just kept here because you're a sinner. So there is a difference, but the fact remains that God has still put you, and we're still strangers in a strange place that's only getting stranger every single day that we're here. But since God has ordained it, according to His perfect plan, which He may not have revealed much of that plan to you, and nor does he, is He obligated to, but though God, God has ordained it, we, like the Jews needed to do in receiving this letter from Jeremiah, need to humbly submit ourselves to Him. We need to humble ourselves, put away our own timelines, put away our own plans that, uh, in trying to, to change the direction of what God has to say to us and humbly listen to what God has to say and live then in the ways that God tells us to live. Humbly submitting to the fact that we're still here while others have preceded us to glory. Why have they gone 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago and not us? That is the Lord's purpose and plan for their life and your life. The goal here for you in your Christian life is not, great, I'm a Christian, the world is ungodly, now I need to get out of here as soon as possible. And that's my goal, is whatever I could need to do to get out as soon as possible. The Lord in His kindness uh, used a pastor named Richard Gans in my life and, uh, and under his ministry that the Lord uh, saved me. Um, and I remember... Uh, There are many things I learned, but one thing that stuck with me, maybe it's the thing that stuck with me the most under the ministry of Rich Gans in in Ottawa, was this. And this is me. I'm in university, and I'm I'm just, my goal is I'm looking to the next thing. You ever do that? You just always, it's not about what you're doing now. It's like I'm in school, but I'm looking to get out of school. I'm looking ahead to the career I'm going to have. 
and the job I'm going to get. And so school was just, I just got to get through university to get to my job. And he, he stopped me in my tracks when he was preaching, and he said, the world tells you, live in the moment. You only live once, right? YOLO. You only live once. You live in the moment. But he said, the Christian lives in the moment for Christ. We are to live in every moment for Christ. Why? And so to me, it was like, why has God put you in university at this particular point? So you live for Christ in that particular point. Stop looking for the next thing, but be content and satisfied and looking to say, Lord, I'm here now. Help me to be faithful in my calling, to study well, to serve the people you've put in my life now, who I'm probably not going to keep in touch with beyond university or whatever it is. And it was just this stuck with me. That is what God is calling us to do. I've put you here. I've put you here. Live now in the moment for Christ. Your Christian calling in this world, now in this moment, is to work faithfully for your God until He brings you out. So that's the call. That's the first uh, part of this letter. God has put you where you are. Probably would have uh, had a few grumbles from that. We'll see, you see that later in, 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 if you keep reading in Jeremiah 29. Not everybody liked that message or thought Jeremiah was faithful. But the question then would be to those who are going to say, okay, God has placed us here, but what does He want us to do? What does He want us to do? Well, God calls you, in our second point, God calls you to work for, Him in, work for Him in the world. He says uh, in verses 5 to 7, build and be fruitful in both field and family. He says, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands. So they may have sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. For the Jews, it would have been very strange to be outside of the promised land. That's how they knew how to serve God. We either lived in Jerusalem, and, uh, and so, you know, with the temple worship was regular, or we at least went, we li- maybe we lived a bit outside, but we still would go for the feasts, and we would go for, you know, uh, those who sought to be faithful. Of course, there were many times the temple itself was closed, but still, for them, the idea of living for God was within the context of the promised land. And now they're out of the promised land. And so it would be natural for them then to think, well, the only way I'm going to be able to serve God is when I get back to the promised land. And so I need to get back to the promised land. We need to get there as soon as possible. There's nothing for us to do here for the Lord. But the Lord comes to them and He, he has a different approach. He has a different view on this because He's, a, he's an international God. He doesn't, you don't need to be in the promised land to serve God. God is there with them in Babylon, and God gives them instructions for serving Him there in Babylon. He had work for them to do while in Babylon for their time then, but also looking to the future. He was still building His church. He was still accomplishing His purposes and bringing the prophecies to pass for the coming of the Messiah. The question for them was, would they listen to what God had to say? God tells them very clearly again. He had told them, and He tells them in verse 10, there's going to be 70 years. So what does He tell them? He says these multiple commands given to their plural, so they're given to all the people, build houses and dwell in them. The fact they pair these together emphasizes the length. Not only are you going to build a house, it's not a rental market you're looking for. Don't rent, but, but build. And not only build, but dwell in it. It's going to be your home for a while. Stay there. Not only plant gardens and do all that, that, uh, that, that work there in, in the spring, but you're going to be there long enough to eat the fruit of it and to go through that cycle any number of times. So plant gardens and eat their fruit. But then, perhaps even more clearly, we see this in verse 6, take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons. So he's saying, not only are you going to have time, if you're, 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 uh, you're, going to, you're going to be able to get married, but you're also going to be able to have children. And then not only are you going to be able to have children, but they're going to have children. That's, you're going to be there a few generations. So live, build up the church, strengthen the covenant people of God. Even outside, they might have thought, you know, I'm outside the promised land. I don't want to raise children in this kind of environment. And God said, raise children. He's not telling them to just get married to Babylonians. Marry within the covenant. Marry faithfully in the Lord as our children ought to do. And, and, and have covenant children. And don't grow weak. Don't sit there and think, I'm just going to wither and die until finally God takes us out. But build, continue to build up the church. And that kind of language of uh, being increased there and not diminished should could possibly, perhaps it brings you back to another time where this was the case. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, as with 70 
uh, uh, Jacob went down to Egypt, and a few hundred years later, they were a couple million people. What do we find in Exodus 1 verse 7? The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. They weren't in the promised land. They were in Egypt. Well, they were in their own section of Egypt, but they were in Egypt, and yet they continued to grow and grow stronger and threatened. Even the, and the Pharaoh tried to deal with that, but it didn't work. That's what God is telling them here. Just like they weren't to set their roots down in Egypt and, and look to that as the final place of their, they're just going to stay here for the entirety of their existence. So that God was saying, He's not saying set your roots in Babylon. You know, make this your final home and your, your forever home, your, your, your destination that you'll be. But for the time that I've put you there, you need to live your life to my glory. You need to do what is faithful. And all it's going to do if you start giving me your timelines or believing the false prophets is make you discontent, you're unhappy with your life, and it's going to be uh, more and more miserable. You know, they were in Babylon. There were times they'd look to the promised land. They would rem remember Jerusalem. As Matthew Henry writes, he said, they cannot but weep sometimes when they remember Zion. And as you and I think of our sin and look to heaven, but as Henry says, let not weeping hinder sowing. Let not weeping hinder sowing. Let them not sorrow as those that have no hope, no joy, for they have both. Now, God hasn't come to you and said you'll have 70 years. We don't know the length of our life. We don't know the timeline that God has given for us. So that we know Christ is coming and that when we do die, we, can, we will go to glory. And we can look forward to heaven. This is not a message that says, stop, don't look forward to heaven. Just, just get, keep your head down in this life. No, we can look forward to heaven. We can long for that perfection that sinlessness, for that life. That's when true, in some sense, true living will really begin. And we can look as we ought to each day for Jesus to come again, and we can pray for Him to come and come quickly. But at the very same time as we do that, we need to live. We need to live the life God has called us to live. We need to take up every one of our, 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 our tasks, our vocations, our families, our hobbies, our uh, service in the community, to take up these things to glorify God, whether you're changing oil or you're changing diapers, whether you're running the race that is set before you, the race of faith or trying to run in the Olympics or whatever you're trying to do, do it to the glory of God so long as it is holy and right in itself. That what God has called you to live, how He's called you to live is, this, is, is how it is important as well, and to, to be part of building up the people of God, to, to live holy, to pursue Christ and to be holy in this life, to raise up a holy seed uh, if God calls you to that, to raise up children to the glory of God, to build His covenant community, to go forth as missionaries into the world, to bring a message of hope, to call others like the Jews could have called the Babylonians to come to know this God. See, that was the message Paul was writing to the Thessalonians because there were those in Thessalonica who, who decided, well, Jesus is coming back, and so I'm going to hang it up. I'm going to hang up. I'm going to I'm going to hang up that. I'm going to put away the hammer, or I'm going to hang up the apron, and I'm just going to sit here, and I'm going to look. And if I'm looking that direction, maybe he'll come, and maybe he'll turn around for a while and look in that direction of the sky. And I'm hoping the clouds. May, oh, those clouds look like they're parting a little bit. Maybe, he's, and they they were becoming. Paul says they're becoming busybodies. They weren't serving any good. They weren't doing anyone any good. They were getting in everybody's business and because they, they had nothing to do. They were bored. And Paul is saying, stop. If you don't want to work, then you can't expect to eat. He was pretty strong in his exhortations. And that same application comes to you and me. That Though we're in the world uh, and we long to be in the world to come, yet God still calls us to be in this world. And so as long as you are, by the grace of God, be faithful. Be faithful to do what He's called you to do, but at the same time still be ready to leave at a moment's notice and leave it all behind to enter into glory. We can live both ways, build and be fruitful in field and family. But the second thing that Jeremiah says here in verse 7 is perhaps I think the most shocking, uh, would be the most shocking to uh, these Israelites, and that was to seek and pray for the peace of the city. Now, these were their enemies they were surrounded by. They had been violently removed from Babylon. This was not a, you know, the, this is not a comfortable first-class ticket to Babylon that they, were, that they had received. They had been moved 1,500 kilometers away from Jerusalem. 
was a long journey, and they were surrounded by people who didn't like them. And, and they had, here, here, here Jeremiah says, there's a bit of irony here, because Jeremiah says, pray for the shalom of the city. Pray, and they had, they're saying, but we left the city of peace. We left Jerusalem. We left the city of peace, and now we're in another city. It's Babylon. That's the quintessential evil city of the Bible. And you're telling us to pray for it and to pray for the people here? that they would have shalom, that they would have peace, that they would have wholeness, that they would have rest, that they would have security, that they would be, that they would be well. Philip Ryken uh, points out here that this sounds very much like uh, so, you know, Psalm 122. We're familiar with Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that psalm ends, right, with uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and seek her strength and seek her well. And, and now Philip Ryken says, now that liturgy of that psalm has been, they're being told, apply that to Babylon. What God is calling them to is not to be living a rebellious life against their governments there, to always be stirring up sedition and trouble, always be clamoring to go free and to be let to go back to Jerusalem, to constantly be trying to, to undermine uh, what was going on, or to... to uh, harm their neighbors or to be rude and inconsiderate. Rather, they were to love them, to show them care, to minister to them in the name of the Lord. They were to seek their best. They were not to live as if, hey, we're just here for a short time, so it doesn't really matter how we live. It doesn't matter if I don't get along with my neighbors. It doesn't matter if, if, uh, if, if there's trouble going on around me in this community and this, there's no peace here. I'm not going to be here all that long. We're leaving soon. We've got my, still got my bags packed. I haven't unpacked. We'll plan on sticking around. And we can do that too, can't we? we? We can live in this world as if it doesn't matter what our governments do or it doesn't matter because, well, we're not here for a long time anyway. And so we don't live. But yet today matters forever. How you live today for the glory of God is going to have an effect that will extend into eternity for your own life and your family's life and the life of your community. And the ultimate way that we can seek the peace of the city where God has placed us and put us is to pray to the Lord for it, is to pray for the city, to pray for the community, your neighborhood and beyond. It's the ultimate seeking, that we would lift them up before the Lord, not just so that they would have some outward peace, though that can be a blessing for a time, but that they would have an eternal peace, that they would know the God who has that they would know the God who has made them also and calls them to faith in Jesus Christ. This, is, this language in Jeremiah 29 is language we find echoed by Jesus in, in the Sermon on the Mount where He says in Matthew 5, 43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven for He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And isn't that the example we find, the example of Daniel? You know, and that, that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, that where Nebuchadnezzar was going to be uh, humbled from his pride, he was going to be cut down, and, and uh, Daniel wasn't like, good on you, this is going to be great, I can't wait to see this happen. No, Daniel said, turn, turn to the Lord, humble yourself, repent of your sin, and for a time, it seemed Nebuchadnezzar did that until he forgot all about it and was raised up in pride and cut down by the Lord for a season. But Daniel prayed for the peace of the kingdom, and he prayed, and he saw it. Even there, he was distressed. He said, may this dream be applied to your enemies, not to you. And God says to us in Jeremiah 29 that if we want to live, uh, live in peace, let's seek the peace of the city, and God will bless us with peace and give us that opportunity to live for Him and serve Him even in the midst of this rebellious world. That language to pray is language also that brings us to the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 2, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul writes, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
in its peace, you will have peace. And what amazing work God will do through us to bring true peace to the hearts of others as we call them to faith in Jesus Christ, who desires all men to be saved. It saddens me a great deal, and I hope it does for you as well, when on all kinds of vehicles, especially family vehicles, we find bumper stickers that are swearing about our prime minister where they're calling for horrible things to be done to our prime minister or waving flags or whatever it might be. How countercultural is it if you and I, instead of saying that or doing that or approving of that, even if in our hearts, if we don't put the bumper sticker on our vehicle, how countercultural if we were to stop and to pray that Justin Trudeau would know divine peace, that shalom would be upon him and his household, not that he would be at peace in sin, but that he would be removed, called out of this world, by the same amazing grace that has called you out of this world. Not because you're better, but because God is gracious. As Calvin writes, he said, if it was the duty of the Jews to pray for the well-being of the Babylonians for this reason, because they were for a certain time under their authority by God's sovereign design, there is no excuse for us when we live under any legitimate prince or ruler, and that not only for a few days, unless we testify our voluntary submission before God. He's saying, we have a much better situation in which to be praying for our leaders. And he who prays to God for the happy state of the country in which he lives will not surely neglect his other duties. So if we don't want to pray for our leaders, we're not going to care much about our society. If we're willing to pray to God for our leaders, it's going to spur us on to not neglect our other duties of service and love for the city in which God has placed us. Another application in relation to this, it's interesting that Philip Ryken, who was uh, a a minister at a large church in Philadelphia, um, he uh, was uh, taking this text and thinking about what it means to be Christians living literally in a city uh, in our day, and to be praying for the peace of the city where they lived and where they were that it is a message of mission for you and I to have, living in our world and living in our communities and around people. And we are tempted, and we talked about this this weekend, we are tempted to retreat from the world. We're tempted to isolate ourselves from the world by withdrawing and pulling back into our own particular small communities of Christians, of those who think like us and, be, and are like us. And, and one example is literally leaving cities who don't want to be too around people, but moving out and be going rural. Now, I realize, and I say this to us because we live rural, and most of us live rural and are not in towns. And so that, that there are reasons to, and there are good reasons to want to move into the country. And this is not a generalization of saying, if you moved into the country or you moved rural, that's automatically wrong. That's not it at all. But it's good for us to examine our motives and our reasons for moving and to say, is it because I don't feel like being around too many neighbors and I don't want to be around other people and it's hard to be a witness in the community and so we kind of withdraw and we pull out and we'd rather have just a couple neighbors on a country block. What difference could Christians make if we were more willing to live in cities? Again, it doesn't mean that you're a sinner for living not in a city. It's just this makes, we have to think about these things and our own motivations, which can often, we make decisions, even like moving, can be very all about us and not thinking about the place where God has put us and the prayers we ought to offer and the service we can render for the sake of Christ. We need then the heart of Christ as we make decisions like that, as you, young, young adults, make decisions about where you're going to raise a family and settle and where you're going to live or as you wrestle with these things that we would be witnesses. But wherever we are, whatever our community, whatever its size, that we would pray for and seek the peace of the place where God has put us. Your Christian calling in this world is to work faithfully for your God until He brings you out. Well, here we've considered the work that God calls us to do, to be faithful to, according to His plan. Now, let's listen to God. That's the final, uh, that's the final exhortation here, to listen to what God has to say. God has given His commands. Will we listen, take stock of our own hearts and lives, consider how it is we are currently living in this world, and what needs to change for us to continue to live better for the glory of God so long as we are here? Will we listen to His wisdom or use our own wisdom? You know, the Jews were tempted to that, and God, God warns them against these false prophets 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. But not only that, he says, nor listen to your, dr- your dreams, which you cause to dream. And I, I don't think this necessarily was what they were sleeping on at night. This seems to be these expectations they had, the daydreaming, the desires of their own hearts. They were dreaming of going free really quickly, and that was where their heart was set. And so since their heart was set there, they weren't living for God as he called them to. God's verdict is terrifying. They prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Don't listen to the false prophets. Don't listen to those who change the ways of the Lord. The fruits of both being a mouthpiece, a false mouthpiece for God, and the fruits of listening and following that way are bitter. God's judgment upon false teachers will be great. But we have our temptations in our own world to be deceived, to to want to hear a message that says, don't worry, you know, the world won't hate you. Just keep your, just, 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 you know, love Jesus, be private about that, and if you're not too public about it, you'll be fine. Or to think that somehow we're going to bring heaven on earth, and we're going to redeem all of our culture, and we're going to be able to make everything glorify God already in this world in the sense of desiring to glorify God. Or the temptations we have to to listen to the Christian politician who, or to, to look for the Christian politician who's going to make everything okay, who's going to save the day, or even the not-so-Christian politician who we still want to put our hope and our trust in to save the day. Rather, you and I ought to take direction from the very Word of God, the Word that we have. From that Word, we learn that we are in this world exactly as long as God wants us to be, not a second longer than is needed and that His plan has, uh, has, and neither should we look to be removed a moment earlier. We ought to humble ourselves under God's plan. We learn that from His Word. From His Word, we also know that Jesus Christ is coming again. The clouds will part and Christ will appear in glory. Christ will call us, will, will not only, will not leave us in this world forever, but will take us out of this world, either at our death or in His coming again if we remain alive. From God's Word, we hear His promises of faithfulness, that so long as you are in the world, Jesus Christ is here with you by His Spirit. He left, He told His disciples, I'm going out of the world, having completed His work in the world, but He said, he said it's good, better for you because now I sent My Spirit to dwell in you. I'm not just going to be with you in bodily presence one at a time, but I'm, My Spirit will dwell in you, and so He is with you. You're not alone. He's not sending you out and saying, I'll see you on the other side. He said, I'm going with you to the other side. I'm going with you every moment, every year, however long. And finally, we learn from the Word that we can, by the grace of God, learn to live well for Him in this world. Live well because all the details of your life have been planned out by Him. You can follow Him, follow His commands, trust Him, even in the hard times. Brothers and sisters, certainly you and I can take comfort that God has saved us out of the world and that heaven is coming. We are going to heaven. We have the Lord's Day today, which is a taste of heaven, a foretaste of it. This is a, a break, as it were, though not completely, as it were, from living in the world because it's a taste. We have a particular way of looking to glory, of looking to heaven, of enjoying a, a rest that will one day be eternal. In a few moments, you're going to be invited to the Lord's Supper to receive the strengthening blessing of Jesus Christ. He's given this to us because He knew He was going to leave us in the world, though He saved us out of the world. We wouldn't need this if we went to heaven and and enjoyed the marriage supper of the Lamb, but He's going to call us there, but yet He gives us strength now. Look eagerly in these things to glory to come, but now, now your Christian calling is in this world, and your Christian calling in this world is to work faithfully for your God until He brings you out. So may the Lord of hosts, the God of the church, give you and me grace to live every day, to live uh, our lives for Him, every day, to live for Him in this world. Let's pray. Lord God, we bless You for giving us instructions and remaining with us through the life that You call us to live in this world. We bless you that in Christ you've called us out of this world. If there are any here who don't know that blessing, Lord, change their hearts and call them today. We ask and pray, Lord, that uh, that we would be faithful, content, 
uh, not bitter about needing to live in this world, but we'd be thankful for your calling, your plans that you have laid out for us. And we know, Lord God, uh, that, that you will be faithful, You for you always have been. We pray now as we receive the strength that you promise, uh, Lord, as we receive these, the, the Lord's Supper, we pray that you would strengthen us as you promised, that we'd receive these things in faith, looking to our Savior and have He perfectly completed His work in this world. So may we follow after Him and so complete our work to your glory, for the building up of your church, and for, uh, Lord, your eternal praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's sing hymn 424, Shepherd of Souls, Refresh and Bless. We'll stand to sing hymn 424. Be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord calls us as His people to live in this present world. But as we've heard already, thank the Lord that He does not leave us alone to do that. He's faithful to remain, in, in, to remain with us, though admittedly we don't always feel His presence as we would like or trust Him as we should. And God is faithful to feed our souls by word as we've had and by sacrament as we will now enjoy. This is indeed what the Lord's Supper is given for. One, to remember the faithful work of Jesus in this world until He returned to glory. Secondly, to receive spiritual nourishment and strength as we feed upon Christ by faith in our hearts for our remaining time in this world. And thirdly, to cause us to look forward, to anticipate Christ coming again, to take us to the place He is now preparing for us and there to receive the fullness of what this meal points us to. So as you 
receive these symbols of Christ's broken body and shed blood. Do so believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as both your, sus- your Savior and sustainer. He has desired to give you this meal. He's the one inviting you who set the table, he invites you as a believer to receive it. And hear then his words of invitation as we consider, hear the words of institution from Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. This is a meal and for remembering Jesus Christ, not just as a historical figure, but as your personal Savior and Lord. And thus, this meal is for those who have both heard and believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who have also, with believing in Christ, have publicly professed that faith and have been received as members into a local church under elders and whose lives actively reflect godly living. Now, this is not a table only for the members of this local church. You're welcome to participate with us this morning if you can affirm these things are true of you. If you can't affirm this, I urge you not to receive the bread or the wine as the elders distribute it. Rather, meditate upon your need for Christ, what you've heard this morning, how you cannot live without Him uh, in this life. And and how you also, as God has given you, to be committed to His church under the care of elders and ordered in, in, in to be fed and encouraged. And for all though who are able to come, come, even if your faith is weak, even if your eyesight of Christ is dim, come, having believed on the Lord Jesus, having been justified freely by His grace, receive His invitation and be blessed as you receive this meal and as the Spirit ministers to you. Let's pray together. Lord, our God, hearing a message on living in the world reminds us of our needs, of our weaknesses, of, our, 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 of, of the strength that we wish we had, but Lord, that we so often feel like we don't have. Oh God, You are the God who can supply and who does supply. Lord, we're thankful that, that You show us our needs and we're not proud and thinking we're strong in ourselves, but Lord, we pray that we now would have that faith to believe upon You and to receive the strength, the, the means of Uh, strengthening that you give to us. Supply our needs, O Lord, as weak as we are. We thank thank you, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world. May we receive you well as we meditate upon your sacrifice for us at the cross and your life lived for us and your death, your, your perfect death, that we would remember, rejoice, and give thanks, that we'd be strengthened in our covenant relationship with you, O God, through the Lord Jesus. And that we, we here in this world, though we are not of it, that we would live faithfully in it, Uh, as committed to that relationship. We pray, uh, Father, that Your Spirit would feed our souls with Christ as we receive uh, the bread and the the, uh, fruit of the vine. We pray then that You would sanctify this bread and the fruit of the vine, which in accordance to Your institution and command, we set apart that is wholly used, that they sacramentally would be the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray that our eyes would not be just merely fixed on earthly things, but on heavenly realities, uh, that we would look beyond uh, the, uh, the, the food and the drink to the spiritual blessing that awaits us and to uh, the Savior to whom these things point. So increase our faith, we pray, strengthen our trust in You and, our, and in Your promises and grow us together as a church in unity and love and mutual support and encouragement and strengthen us to live for You in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's the elders who are serving to come forward. Just a note as we distribute the elements that the bread is, uh, is gluten-free, and the, uh, for the, the wine, it's the outer two rings are wine, and the inner ring uh, is grape juice. And so, uh, that's for you, too, as you, uh, as you take the fruit of the vine.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which He was betrayed, He took bread, and He blessed it, and He broke it, and He gave it to His disciples, and He said to them, take, eat, this is my body. As you receive the bread, as you ponder Christ, hear the words of Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon Him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. After our same manner, our Savior took the cup and He gave thanks and He gave it to His disciples saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Back in John 15 again, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples."
Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, thank you for your kindness to us, for your love toward us as your people, for feeding us and giving us to drink. Lord, not just physically to sustain the body, but spiritually, that, oh Lord, we would be sustained as we meditate upon Jesus Christ, as we remember that He not only, uh, not remember not only what He has done in the past, but also, Lord, receiving Him by faith and so being ministered to now by the Spirit. His body and blood applied to us. We thank you for that. We pray that we each would receive by faith. We would look to him uh, in heaven even as we meditate upon what we've just done. We thank you, God, for your gracious care to us, your renewing uh, of your covenant with us. We pray that we too would renew our covenant with you, would be faithful to you, would be desiring to serve you in this world, and give us the grace to do that. Thank you, Lord God, for such mercies, for blessing us together, and continue to do so. We commit our, our lives to you, our service to you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's conclude our worship service singing hymn 652. Savior, teach me day by day. 652, and we'll stand to sing. After the benediction, we'll sing our doxology, which is hymn 439, verse 4. You can find those words also printed in your bulletin. Receive now the blessing of God and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.